as we begin the first day of our floor period um, this month to talk about the things that are most important to us. Uh, for anybody who has been watching at home, uh, especially since last year's election, they know that one of the most important issues for every single voter in last fall's election, and I think for every single Wisconsinite, is to make sure that the people who have pre-existing conditions never worry about losing that coverage. Uh, I know it's something that both Governor Walker at the time and Governor Evers uh, at the time as well have supported and want to see if we can find an answer. Last week, Governor Evers reached out to Senator Fitzgerald and I. The two of us sat down. Uh, we actually had a chance to briefly talk about some of the things that he had requested. And we're actually going to allow uh, the members and the authors who are working on the bill to talk about the specifics. And then we'll come back and take questions at the end. But first, I wanted Jim just to talk a little bit about how we're going to work today. And then we'll turn it over to the authors. Yeah, so basically the plan is just like any other day to go in at 1 o'clock. Uh, we'll start debate on. Uh, the pre-existing condition bill and obviously there's going to be an end time when uh, the governor and his people need to get in to start preparing for the state of the state uh, but our intention is to start at one and end at some point when the governor and his entourage need to get in there to, to, to start setting up the room yeah so and you've had an agreement hopefully with the minority that they um, we're gonna hopefully have a good productive debate but it should hopefully end at a reasonable time so they can get prepared Right. Um, so we have had a lot of members in our caucus who have worked on this topic, but the three who probably know it best, um, Representative Peterson, who is the author of the pre-existing condition bill last session and worked on it this session as well, uh, Chairman San Filippo, the Chairman of the Health Committee, and Representative Roarcast, who's been working on uh, the new edition we're going to put in the bill that they'll talk about. So I'd ask those three gentlemen to come forward and we'll turn over uh, the opportunity for that. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much. As, sorry, as Speaker uh, Voss had mentioned, uh, we wanted AB1, the very first bill to deal with uh, pre-existing conditions. We had made a promise last session. We passed a bill last session, and then uh, we reiterated that promise on the campaign trail. In fact, really, every single person who was on a state ballot uh, last year dealt with this issue as our constituents brought it up. So we wanted to move forward with bringing back AB1, making some changes based on uh, feedback that we had gotten off the first version of the bill, and hopefully we're going to be able to get it passed today and get it through the rest of the legislature and have Governor Evers sign the bill. I'll let Mike and Kevin talk specifically about the bill, and then we can answer questions. I'll cover the first four main elements of the bill. One is to remember this bill only takes effect if the Affordable Care Act goes away, either by lawsuit, by Congress not replacing it. So that's key point number one. And then there's three elements to the bill that are very important. Uh, number one is it prevents denying someone coverage or a policy because they have a pre-existing condition known as guaranteed issue. It prevents refusing to cover services that people need to treat a pre-existing We are going to add language in an amendment uh, to consideration that would basically mirror the Affordable Care Act's protection uh, so that we will ensure that people are not negatively impacted. If you're a, um, either an individual or a parent with either a loved one or a, ch a child, a spouse, a friend who could actually lose coverage because of hitting one of those maximums, we're trying to take that fear away. Um, we believe that that's the right thing to do. That's what people in Wisconsin want from us. The lifetime cap issue was one of the issues that was raised in the meeting with Governor Evers and Speaker Voss and Senator Fitzgerald, which is why um, after consideration we thought it makes sense to consider that uh, option or that item that the governor had requested and that will be included in the amendment uh, that comes out today. Questions? So clearly, you will you are banning 
annual and lifetime maximums that we know annual or max or lifetime maximums? We're mirroring the ACA protections for that, yes. What do you say to critics who uh, raise concerns about the cost that people, without an individual mandate, um, people won't get insurance when they're young and healthy and that the pool will become, uh, you know, we'll have sicker people in it and costs for everybody will go very high. They could join the lawsuit, which is why we know Obamacare probably doesn't work. <laughs> I would add that there are many provisions of the ACA that cause uh, an increase in, in health care costs that are um, separate from pre-existing conditions and annual and lifetime maximums. When you look at the cost of, of health care, uh, those two items, the pre-existing and the annual, that's, those are two items. Then there's also what's actually covered under those, uh, covered under the health care plans. So there's many other parts, even the provision in the ACA that allows families to keep kids on the health care plan up until they're 26. That uh, brings up, or that actually causes costs to go up because those people don't go in in their earlier ages, so that causes sometimes people that are sicker into the plans. So there's a whole bunch of provisions. That's a point that I'm trying to make. There are a lot of provisions in the ACA that currently lead to higher health care costs. We wanted to pick on the two issues that are most important to constituents and residents in the state of Wisconsin. We want to take that fear away from them that they could lose coverage for either themselves or a loved one if there's a pre-existing condition or if they would be affected by an annual or a lifetime max. I also think it's important to remember that during the campaign, the topic of pre-existing conditions was foremost on everybody's mind and it was at front and center in everybody's campaign. And at that time, there were no strings attached. The promises made by politicians running for office, all of us in this room and practically everybody in this building, was that we are going to protect people with pre-existing conditions. So to come up with any excuse under the sun to be able to not honor that promise right now is a problem, I think, and that's why this is AB1. But that is an issue, and that's come up, of course. It, it appears that you have given the Democrats just about everything that they asked for, that they campaigned on. Yet, um, they have said, as of last week, they said they're not interested in your pre-existing condition bill. Do you think the amendment attached here and what you will deliver will bring those Democrats along to what they've asked for all along the campaign trail? Well, I certainly think in any negotiation each side has to give some and I think we're at a point where uh, both sides should feel comfortable with where we're, where we're at. We're adding something that specifically at the request of Governor Evers to this bill today um, and as we go forward we're all going to have to answer the voters, answer to the voters. We all talked about this on the campaign trail, both Governor Evers and just about everybody in the legislature made these promises that we were going to pass the bill to cover people with pre-existing conditions. Now it's time for everybody to step up to the plate and honor their word during the campaign. Essential health benefits was the other piece of the governor's ask. Is that going to be included in your amendment? Or? So essential health benefits basically do not are not part of what we talked about during pre-existing conditions. So the idea of saying that anybody who has a medical condition has the ability to know for sure, as my colleagues have said, that they're not going to reach a lifetime maximum, they're not going to reach an annual maximum, and they're never going to have their premium go up just because they have been sick or they get sick. That's what we're focusing on. Now, unfortunately, if people want to try to throw other things into the mix to stop the deal from happening, I think that's the cynicism that people do not want in politics, right? These things have nothing to do with pre-existing conditions. So my hope is that as people adapt to their new roles, you know, for eight years, Democrats have been nothing but 24-7 bomb throwers always trying to figure a reason that a deal should break apart. Now they have to actually sit at the table and negotiate and give. Here we are taking one of the things that Governor Eber said was really important to him in the meeting that I had with him, that we cover people with lifetime maximums, that they don't have a lifetime maximum. We sat in our caucus, we talked about it, we agreed that that's a reasonable proposal, so we're going to put that in our idea. So for them to say, if I don't get everything, I'm going to veto a bill that protects people with pre-existing conditions, I think that would be a disappointment to the state and it certainly would be a bad sign for things to come that you know it's either my way or the highway. We're trying to listen, trying to accommodate where we can, but also stick to our principles, which are focusing on just the topic that we all campaigned on, and then trying to make sure we address the problems that are real, not, uh, not those other ones. 
So if you've met with Governor Beavers and talked about the lifetime caps and he asked to have it added, we're adding it. Has he committed to signing this bill and where's the Senate? So Senator Fitzgerald and I met with um, Governor Evers very briefly on Thursday. We had hoped to meet with him again that same day. His schedule didn't permit. Uh, we had hoped to meet with him again this morning. His schedule did not permit. So Senator Fitzgerald and I have not had an opportunity to sit down with him again, even though we had made multiple requests to sit down. So we're at the point where 20 minutes before the floor, we are going to proceed with our idea, which I think takes the idea that he proposed, the best ideas that we have, and we'll send it to the Senate. Now, I never speak for the Senate, but I've had really good conversations with Senator Fitzgerald. We've talked to Senator Fine and Senator Jacques, who are the co-authors uh, of the bill in the Senate. I think we're all in support of what we're doing today. So I hope that we'll be able to get it to Governor Evers as quickly as possible so no one ever has to worry about this topic again. So Fine and um, Jacques are both on board with the amendment you're proposing today? They can speak for themselves, but they were included in our initial discussions, and I believe they are, but you have to ask them just to confirm. What do you say to the million and a half Wisconsinites who are on self-insured plans who would not be covered under this bill? Uh, the good news is um, that we are doing everything that we can. Um, as you mentioned, for people who are self-insured, the state of Wisconsin has no control over that whatsoever. Um, that is decided by um, our federal Congress, so we will see what happens. I mean, we know that even when Republicans attempted to do the repeal and replace, and I'll let Representative Peterson talk about that, many of the items that were in what we're talking about today were part of what Republicans supported in replacing Obamacare. So they should be issues that no matter what happens at the federal level, no matter if a lawsuit is settled or found in favor of getting rid of Obamacare, these are the things we've all agreed to already at both the state and the federal level. So Representative Peterson? Yes, yeah, so if you look at when the federal Congress did the repeal and replace last year for uh, the Affordable Care Act, even though they removed many of the things that are causing people heartache they maintained three essential pillars inside that replacement. Number one and foremost was the pre-existing conditions, which we are doing today in this bill. Number two is they maintained that there would no longer be annual or lifetime caps. And number three, they retained the essential benefits. So we are picking up two out of three, we believe, tied together today in Assembly Bill 1 and maintaining those. Prior to my legislative experience, I headed up HR for a Fortune 400 company here in, in the state of Wisconsin, and we had to go through the Affordable Care Act, and we had a self-funded plan. Um, we were never concerned about the pre-existing condition clause or the annual and lifetime maximum protections that were uh, mandated by the ACA. Those were not a concern to us because we thought those were good policy and also good practically for corporations. You couldn't recruit people if you put those kinds of restrictions back in. People just would not move employers. Right now, the biggest issue facing our state is we don't have enough either workers or qualified people to take jobs. So the last thing that any company is going to do is uh, make it even harder for them to recruit uh, qualified people. And using in pre-existing conditions and uh, lifetime maximums would be a negative to trying to recruit people either to companies in the coming to the state or moving between companies. In your conversations with Governor Ebert, Governor Ebert what did you talk about in terms of the state of the state? What are you hoping comes out of tonight? Um, we didn't talk about that. Um, to be honest, it was a, a very brief meeting just about pre-existing conditions. But what I will say is this. Um, we are incredibly blessed that we have had a robust economy that has produced a much larger than normal surplus. We have still been able to invest in public schools and health care and all of the things that have made Wisconsin great. We have a record low unemployment. We have record low foreclosure rates. We have more people um, that are creating jobs than almost any time in our state's history. And we have a huge amount of unfilled positions where people can go out, if they want to find a job, they can find one today. So the best thing that Republicans are giving Governor Evers is the gift of a growing economy that we can all be proud of after eight years of having Republicans in charge. So I am optimistic that he is going to take our growing economy that we all now share in, that we all can benefit from, and focus on investing in the priorities where we can find common ground. We want to put more money in public schools. We want to make sure that we have every opportunity to guarantee that we do his middle income tax cut. Remember, we announced our plan last week using the Republican surplus to pay for the Tony Evers middle class tax cut. I think there are a lot of things that I would love for him to say tonight. If he picks the tone of, 
partisan rhetoric and divisive issues and trying to somehow say, here's all the liberal checklists that I want to go off of, well, that'll be really disappointing because we, if you'll notice the rhetoric that we are using, we are not focusing on every single hot button issue that perhaps people who are in our base want us to focus on. We're attempting to try to find the middle ground to say, let's argue as we need to, but let's not pick fights in the first few months of the administration. So my hope is he would echo that and he would not use all kinds of partisan rhetoric that draws applause, um, but we'll see. Speaking of which, have you talked, as you have been just talked in the last week about pre-existing condition, but has the governor's office talked to you further about the Tony Evers tax cut plan that you build as the Tony Evers tax cut plan? Um, last week they said, no, this this doesn't do it for us. They didn't necessarily explain why it didn't do it for them. Did you get any answers from the Evers camp? No. 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 <laughs> I mean, and, and hopefully as we go forward, we're going to move this bill through the regular process. We'll introduce it. Uh, we'll have plenty of time for co-sponsorships, people to have their names on. Uh, we'll hold Hopefully hearings. Democrats will join us. Hopefully. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that was one of the promises on the campaign trail as well. So uh, hopefully as we hold hearings and more of the public gets involved and lets the governor know how important this is to him and how reasonable they think it is to uh, to u utilize a surplus to cut people's taxes instead of raising taxes on some and reducing taxes on others. Hopefully he'll come around and hopefully his, uh, his mind will change. But really getting back to the to the state of the state. Uh, anybody that follows me on social media knows that baseball is, is kind of big in my, my life and my kid's life. I mean, Tony Evers is really uh, the manager of a team that has bases loaded, uh, the cleanup hitter at bat with nobody out. I mean, he is inheriting an extremely good position in the state of Wisconsin. It's gonna be very easy for him to score runs if he's willing to work with us on stuff. And the, the thing that would be nice too is why don't you ask Governor Evers what he thinks? Don't just accept the fact that he puts out a statement. Why don't you ask him, are you willing to negotiate or are you only going to say it's got to be exactly however you draft it? Because we've already said we don't have a whole lot of bottom lines in this first um, stage of the negotiations. We're not going to raise income and sales taxes under any circumstances. We're not going to expand government-run health care. But beyond that, we're really trying to say, where can we work together? So if he's saying the only way we'll ever cut taxes is by raising taxes, well, then we're never going to cut taxes. So that's our problem. The governor has sent a letter both to the chief clerks asking to provide his budget address on the first Tuesday in March, March 5th. Have you guys agreed to that? So you will see today um, that we are going to grant a one-month extension up to February 28th. So that will be one of the longest extensions we have ever given. Uh, I believe the extension we gave to Governor Walker, we had a budget repair bill in the middle. If you remember, that's why the extension was even, I think, a week longer. So uh, we certainly hope he'll do it sometime in February, which would still be one of the later addresses that we have ever done, but certainly an extra month is warranted. Yeah. Do you think wedding bonds should have to get liquor licenses? So, you know, it's interesting because um, luckily for Robin Voss, uh, an awful lot of wedding barns are located in my assembly district. Uh, so I certainly have talked to those entrepreneurs. I certainly understand the fact that they did something uh, under interpretation of the law where no one stopped them from operating the way that they were. I, I always have a soft spot in my heart for when people do something thinking that the government has never told them they cannot and only sudden after eight or 10 years they change the rules. So I don't know if the necessary answer is for us to pass legislation. It could just be an interpretation. I have no idea where the Ebers administration is going to be on the topic. So rather than having everybody run to us saying, fix this problem, how about if you run to the Ebers administration and say, how are you going to interpret the law? You know, you have the ability. The Walker administration did it one way. You have the ability to do the next. So I guess my preference is to first see if a law is required then have negotiations, because I understand there are people who have done nothing wrong on the other side, who opened up a banquet hall, found it all, or you know, followed all the rules and regulations, and now they are also disadvantaged because they did nothing wrong either. So we might have to have some kind of legislation, but I want to make sure that Governor Evers has a chance to figure out what's his answer and how is he going to interpret it before we rush out and say this is a, this is a solution. But do, you, do you agree with uh, the former Attorney General's interpretation of the law, the Attorney General Brad Schimmel's interpretation of the law? So for much of Wisconsin, what I'm going to say, they're really happy to hear. Thank God I'm not a lawyer. Uh, so I cannot say what the legal opinion does or does not do. 
you know, I do not want to have a situation where somebody did everything according to the rules as they understood them, no one told them no, and then all of a sudden they are told that they have to follow some new set of rules that they had no say in. So I want to be consistent, but I also want to have an opportunity for our, our caucus has not talked about it. We have not had a discussion if we need to do a new law. So let's first allow Governor Evers to put his position out there where his department's going to go, and then we'll address whether or not it's right or wrong. We've already had a lawsuit going. Is it best to have this resolved by the courts, or should it be resolved by the legislature or the governor? Well, I would always prefer it to be resolved outside the courtroom, but that's why it's hard to say they are going to sue, because now we have a new administration with new people in the job. No, I know that, but I'm saying that but the court also, I don't know how they're going to do it, not being a lawyer, um, but it would make sense to me to say, well, how are they going to interpret the statutes with the new people that are in there? Because maybe the lawsuit will be moot, or maybe the lawsuit will be under the wrong terms. I, I don't know, but I'd like to at least see that first. Would you consider legalizing medical marijuana? So I'm in a different place than perhaps some other people are. Um, you know, I have said for years that I'm open to the idea of legalizing <coughs> medical marijuana. Um, I have also said, though, that I do not want it to be like a half-handed effort like in other states where you can grow it yourself, you can you know, get a, a, a phony doctor's excuse, you can get all these kind of things where it's not sincere. If someone has a real medical condition, um, I have got another soft spot in my heart because I want to make sure that they are able to deal with a chronic pain condition. So I think that there is a potential that we could find some other state around the country that perhaps has done this wisely in a very narrow and limited way that we could talk about. It. Now, having said that, that is just Robin Boss. That is not the assembly. That is not my job as speaker. That is one person of 99. So I don't want to have everybody say assembly Republicans have said this. Okay. But I, we have not talked about that as a caucus, which is why you know I have my own position. And that's why we have to get there. Now, I think that what Governor Evers did last week was incredibly counterproductive, right? So if his goal was to actually say, can we have a reasonable discussion about medical marijuana? One thing that I have always been very fearful of is that I don't want to have medical marijuana, which I support, somehow lead us down a slippery slope to where there's pot on every corner. I am not a supporter of legalization. So the fact that he started out saying he's open to legalization of medical marijuana, and literally in the same day, slid down the slope to say he would support full legalization is exactly what many of us are afraid of. So I hope he has not poisoned the conversation through his own inexperience, but perhaps he has. So I guess we'll just have to see, but it's too early to tell. So the governor has created a gateway conversation, then, is that what you're saying? Well, he's just, he's just honestly played into the fears of a lot of us that may support medical marijuana. It's one of the biggest concerns is having a system in place that's regulated enough so that you don't have any, anybody going to the doctor's office and getting a script for medical marijuana because they have a soft tissue injury or something along those lines. It should be for people with debilitating diseases or chronic, chronic pain, uh, things of that nature. But if if this is really the first step, is, is what he said I think uh, last week, this would be a first step towards recreational marijuana, that, that's a problem for a lot of our caucus and I'm not sure how we uh, regain the trust that this is the first and only step uh, when it comes to medicinal marijuana. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you.